So what do you need to get married religiously? You need a proposal from one side. It can be either from the boy's side or the girl's side. You know, the culture tells you that only the boy's side must propose. Islam tells you either way. You can have a woman who has proposed to marry. No problem. You like someone, you really think they are a good person, or you feel you've come across someone okay, so on. Get it official. You see, for as long as it is unofficial, you could be being used. The minute it is official, then by the will of Allah, you are protected by a bill of rights. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us protection. So there is the proposal that comes from one side, number one. Then there is something known as the qabul. The acceptance comes from the other side. In the interim, between these two, the two can get to know one another properly. They can meet each other as many times as possible on condition that it is done within close proximity of a, of a male chaperone or a mahram of the girl or the female. The reason is we don't want someone to con our daughter. We don't want someone to try and show the goodness. We don't want someone to abuse or misuse or should I say seize perhaps the gullibility of our daughter and so on. So for that reason, he may come home and he may see her, he may ask her questions and so on in our presence. And when we say presence, close proximity, and he may ask as many questions as he wants and she may do the same. They may then agree or disagree. If they agree, they may want to meet again and again and again. The minute they feel that now it's we don't want to continue with this, they now break off completely. And it's quite easy because you would not have been attached. The minute there is an attachment, it's quite hard to break up. Then you say, no, you know what, even though I'm not so much for it, but now everything has gone so far, we've already had three children, now we'd rather get them. <laughs> <laughs> Thereafter, if they do agree to continue, you have an acceptance from the other party. In the presence of a minimum of two male witnesses, and you need to have something known as a mahar. A mahar is not a dowry. A mahar is, I like to term it a down payment. You know what's a down payment? That means this is my first amount, the rest are to follow. <laughs> Mahab is a gift from the groom to the bride. Pure gift. Today, mashallah, if Abdul Rahman doesn't mind me making mention of, he had spoken to me earlier, what should we give? I said, well, they need to decide it. He says, well, they are easygoing people. I said, you're lucky. Said, <laughs> so, mashallah, a gold dinar, a proper gold Nabawi dinar, and 10 silver dirhams have been given as maha this evening. So it's something very good. It is more symbolic than anything else. It is just to say, look, your responsibility of food, clothing, accommodation, looking after is now mine. I'm the husband and this is the gift to you. And she does whatever she wants with it. Remember, in Islam, a female has her own ownership and possession, which the husband does not have a right to enter into or to you sir, he can only guide her if she's going wrong. Look, don't spend in this direction. So we ask the Almighty to help us understand the right of the woman in Islam. Uh, then you need to have also the father of the bride giving the bride away. That is the ideal situation that should be happening. And this evening, inshallah, we will be witnessing that. So the father will be the guardian and representative at the same time, known as a wali. Wali giving the uh, bride away. If there is a difficulty or an issue with that, then inshallah you can speak to the ulama. Sometimes, you know, people are deceased. Sometimes there is another problem and so on. You speak to the scholars and you try and get an understanding and explanation. Perhaps another person can fit that position. Uh, once that happens and all this has happened in one city, the two are declared married. So there's nothing happening more than that. So today you will hear a question posed to the father of the bride, do you give your daughter? A question posed thereafter to the groom, have you accepted this? And he will say yes, and we will make mention of a maha, maha meaning uh, the gift given to the bride, and we will make mention of the witnesses who are witnessing here this evening, no one in particular, but everyone who is seated here. So that is as far as how it goes. Look at how simple it is. I thought the messenger says when the nikah is ready, when the parties are okay with everything, don't delay. Because the more you delay, the greater the chances of committing adultery with a person you're ready to marry. What's the point? May the Almighty grant us safety and may He protect us at all times. The issue of trust. If you do not trust your spouse, you're wasting your time. Trust comes now. It is built and sown right now. The seeds of trust are sown right now. 
So you trust one another, come what may. When you hear an anonymous caller calling you, that is a lie. No matter how true it sounds, it's a lie. Throw it out, you will be happy. The minute you are to entertain someone else and their stories, you are not going to be happy. And the day you break up, they will be laughing. And they will be excited. May the Almighty protect us from mischief makers. And may He make us from those who can help our spouses trust us. There's no point in saying, trust me, trust me. But everything you're doing is testing my trust for you. May the Almighty grant us goodness. And this leads us to something else. We need time with one another. Spend maximum time with one another. The Prophet ﷺ says, لِيَسَعْكَ بَيْتُ You want to succeed in life? Spend maximum time at home. Your wife, your children. SubhanAllah. Your children. And perhaps your parents and so on. When you are at home, especially after the evening prayer, he says if you do not have something constructive to do, make sure you're at home. Quality time. This means your friends. Sorry for looking at you. But your friends become secondary. Your wife becomes primary first. Which means, if your friends feel bad, that oh, this guy is now, you know what, he is controlled by his wife, they can keep on uttering those statements for as long as you are happy. This is a fact. You want your marriage to work, your spouse comes number one. Your immediate family, number one. They're after your friends. So if you have 911 from them and from them, you know where to go first, inshallah. May Allah safeguard us and grant us goodness and may He open our doors. It's something very important. People don't know how to prioritize. You want to go on holiday? Take her with you. You want to get somewhere? Take her with you. And another thing, transparency. But they all start with T. We said trust. We said time. Now we're talking of transparency. Be transparent as possible. Don't have hidden agendas in the closet. You know, the phone has got three locks. Why? First one, in case she gets through. The second one, in case she gets through. The third one, she'll never get through. <laughs> That brings me to another point. Reassurance of the spouse or to the spouse of your love verbally and in other ways is very, very important. Keep on uttering it to them. Keep on every day in different ways. Look at them, smile at them, and you utter these words of how much you love them. You make a difference. No point in saying, can't you feel it? Come on. Come on. What don't I do for you? That's not good enough. As much as you do for them, you still need to utter the words of love for them. And every day, just like you are engaging in an act of worship, you know, you need to tell them how much you love them in various ways. You know, you need to keep on looking at them, staring at them, how beautiful they are, because you don't want them to feel that coming from someone else than yourself. This is why the Prophet, peace be upon him, says, Nikah must be in the masjid, open for everybody to attend. There is no restriction of entry here. Why? Because everyone comes, they can sit and watch, get a reminder, and at the same time they can think to themselves, you know what, I need to resolve my own problems. I need to make myself a person who can learn a lesson from this, go home and say, look, I'm sorry. I'm really, really, very sorry. You know, we don't want it like the Imam in the masjid, he said, uh, when you go home, I'm sure you've heard this from me before, you need to make sure you praise the cooking of your wife. She's been working so hard in the kitchen. She's actually been there for so long. And whatever she cooks, when last did you say, wow, what a meal, subhanAllah, what a meal. Today I received an email where somebody said, and I'm sure you must have seen it, it's been doing its rounds for a few years. They say the son was watching his father when the mother had burnt the toast. And he came in and he didn't even notice that the toast was burnt. He didn't even notice. He ate it and he said, wow, that was such a lovely meal. And later on, when they were going to sleep, the son goes to the father and says, Dad, do you really like burnt toast? Because he uttered a comment, I love burnt toast, you know, this type of toast. <laughs> do you really like burnt toast? So the, son, the father called his son close. He says, listen, son, burnt toast doesn't hurt anyone. But what you say from your mouth can be very hurtful. Look at the comment. The burnt toast doesn't hurt anyone. Don't. What you said from your mouth can be very hurtful. So just say, I love it. I like it. But together with that tolerance, you need to tolerate some differences that you may have. You've been brought up totally different. Different parents, different sometimes countries, cities, likes, dislikes. Whatever is within the limits of the law, you need to try your best to adopt and adjust to it. Whatever is out of line. You need to make it clear, look, this thing here, I'm not happy with it because the Almighty will be displeased if we do it this way. There you are. You've made your lines very clear. 